from verse 18. Romans chapter 8 from verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage and corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly await for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purposes. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us, how will not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribu tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we have been killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. Do you remember Comical Alley? Does that ring a bell to you? Comical Alley? It's a long time ago now. In the Iraq War, uh, the one that, uh, when they went all the way to Baghdad and deposed of Saddam Hussein, uh, there was a spokesman for the Iraqi government, and his name was Ali something. And he got nicknamed in the Western press, Comical Ali. And he was called Comical Ali because he kept on saying the wonderful victory of the Iraqi armed forces against the imperialist forces of the British and Americans at the time when they were driving them uh, across the desert towards Baghdad. The final one from Com Comical Ali was this. He was standing in a square in Baghdad claiming that the heroic Iraqi forces were throwing back the invasion forces of the Americans and the British and behind him you could see all these American tanks pulling up. So they called him Comical Ali. He's, he's lost touch with reality, this man. He's talking about great triumph, and in fact, for his side, if you see, is tragedy. <laughs> They've been fully, completely beaten, driven back. Comical Ali. I believe there's a lot of people who look at we Christians and they, they think we're comical allies. That we proclaim this great triumph of Christ, that we are the inheritors of this great triumph of Christ, but yet all round about us we've got declining numbers, we have all the same problems and difficulties of everybody else. We're comical alleys, you know, we're, we're calling that a triumph. Where is this triumph? You're clearly being beaten. You've been beaten in your influence in the society in which you live in. 
they call this the post-Christian age now. So often in our lives, we can be shown to be no different than anybody else. We have sicknesses, we have illnesses, we have difficulties, we have family problems, we have work problems. Where is this triumph? And in this passage, there are many very triumphant verses. Verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. Verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 37 and 39 talk about this. It talks about this very great triumph. Paul says that we are more than conquerors. And yet... In this same passage, Paul says we are suffering. In verse 36, he quotes from Psalm, uh, Psalm 44, verse 22. For we are, for your sake we have been killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. In verse 17, just the verse before we took up the reading, where it told there that not only are we likely to suffer, we should expect to suffer for Christ's sake. Wherein is our triumph? We're being slaughtered like sheep. We face all the same problems and difficulties of the people of this world. We get sick. We lose our jobs. It's true also. I, 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 I don't know when I first came to this church. Quite many number of years ago now. Many more and more people here then than now. Where is it our triumph then? How can we reconcile these wonderful words of more than conquerors and yet we're suffering? We have difficulties, we have problems. They sometimes seem to overwhelm us. Now, one of our common res responses to this is to pray for God to remove our sufferings from us. Pray to God, you know, open up the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing and fill our churches again. In other words, God, snap your fingers and deliver us. Remove from us our difficulties and our problems. Remove from us the obstacles and difficulties that we face. Now, it is true that sometimes uh, God does directly intervene and remove our sufferings, our dangers and our problems. But more often than not, this is what God does. He navigates us. He guides us through our sufferings and our problems and our difficulties. Whether that be personal, family, work, our fellowships, in the troubled waters that we can sometimes find ourselves into us, very often what we need to look for is God to guide us through these waters, these dangerous waters. Uh, for a short while, Morag and I were down in, uh, we used to live in Cornwall, just over the border in Cornwall, and I worked at the University of Plymouth, and uh, we used to sometimes go and look out over Plymouth Sound. In Plymouth Sound, there a lot of ships coming and going, in particular uh, naval ships, there's a big naval dockyard, Devonport, in, in Portsmouth. And I once saw, it's scrap now, I think, it was before the aircraft carriers we've got now, and they had one aircraft carrier, it wasn't an aircraft carrier, it was a helicopter carrier called HMS Ocean, it was a big ship and I saw it coming in through Plymouth Harbour, uh, Plymouth Sound and it went up along this narrow passageway of the River Tamar to Devonport and how did it do that? A pilot guided it, it wasn't the captain of the ship that guided it, a pilot guided it and you could see the ships coming in and out of Plymouth and they were guided by a pilot you see the pilot boats going out when the ship came, and then when they were out into the open sea, the pilot got back onto his boat and came back in. Who guided them through the difficult waters so that they would get to the safe destination? The pilot. 
And that's what we need, a pilot. And I'm going to uh, show to us hopefully that there is a pilot. There is somebody who can guide us through these difficult waters. And that the triumph is ours. And that we should be a joyful, grateful, thankful people. So although God sometimes delivers us, often he guides us through it. This is confirmed, isn't it, by the record of the New Testament. Peter was delivered from prison in Jerusalem, but Christ prophesied that in his old age he would be taken away and killed. And reliable non-biblical sources, it's true to say, but they are reliable, was that Peter was martyred in Rome. Stephen, James, and John the Baptist were killed. They weren't delivered. They were killed. Or the Apostle Paul himself. He was stoned, shipwrecked, beaten several times, imprisoned several times. Nearly everyone abandoned him towards the end of his life. He was ill and was not healed. He was often in severe financial difficulties. And again, reliable, not again, non-biblical sources, but reliable sources tell us that the Apostle Paul was martyred also in Rome, probably around the same time that Peter was. And yet, all of these people that I mentioned, Peter, Stephen, James, John the Baptist, the Apostle Paul, were more than conquerors. But they did not have an easy navigation through this life. They suffered in ways, I think, which we will never be called upon to suffer like this. If you read the list in Corinthians of what happened to Paul, I don't think there's anybody in this room who could say that they could match that. Stoned, shipwrecked, bitten by a snake, beaten by the Romans, beaten by the Jews, imprisoned several times, ill, and he wasn't healed from his illness. Sometimes he didn't know, he said he didn't have enough to eat, didn't know how he was going to live. And yet Paul wrote these words, we are more than conquerors. So what we need to do is look at three things. Oh, that's how we're going to look at it. What is it that we triumph over? What is our triumph? Secondly, how do we triumph? How do we get this triumph? How do we secure this triumph that Paul's talking about? And then finally, what's the implications of our triumph for how we should live here and now in this difficult, trying world? Well, first of all, what do we triumph over? It's a good thing when we're looking at scripture always to look at the context of what has been written about. So what is the context in which Paul uh, talks about the future glory from verse 18. The context is this. He talks in verse 11 about being raised into a new body. For Paul, the great triumph is summed up in this. It's the triumph over sin and its consequence, death. And its ultimate outcome the resurrection into a new body which will never grow old never get sick and the moving into the fullness of the kingdom of God in the new heaven and the new earth where there is no war there is no injustice there is no cruelty there is only peace and harmony and love this is the triumph that is ours the triumph of Christ is this he has won for us Freedom from sin and death. He is navigating, piloting us through this life to a new resurrected body that will never age, that will never get sick. Oh, I'm longing for this body. I'm just talking today and I've got a problem with my hand, problem with my leg, problem with my eyes, problem with my ears. Uh, many of you I know have got many, many worse problems than that. Those of us who are getting on, we know about this. A new body, what a thing, eh? But also this, a new heaven and a new earth. This is the triumph that Christ has won for us. 
And Paul says, we have already received the triumph. We have been rescued from sin and death. Here and now, if we are in Christ, if we have repented and believed in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, we have already entered into the triumph. We are delivered from our sin and from its consequence, death. But we wait for the fullness of this with the redemption of the body. The total victory, the total triumph that is ours comes when Jesus comes again. And we're resurrected into a new body. And the new heaven and the new earth comes. And we dwell in it forever and ever. Is that what you and I long for? Or do we long for God somehow to just snap his fingers and deliver us from our problems? That's not our triumph. Paul's not talking about that here. Paul's going through enormous hardships when he writes these words. What Paul's triumph is this. We are more than conquerors in Christ because he has delivered us from sin and death. We who have repented and believed. Now I have to ask you this question. Have you repented and believed in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin? Are you trusting only and completely in your faith in Jesus Christ to deliver you from the consequences of sin? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Have you repented and believed? No, I said repented and believed. Many people say to me they believe. I'm talking to many prisoners and say, oh yes, I believe. And I say to them, have you repented? Have you turned from your sins? Have you acknowledged the awfulness of your sins before God? Have you acknowledged that you do not deserve to be delivered from your sins? Are you remorseful? Am I remorseful for the sins that I committed? The offense to God that my life has been? The things that I have done that I should not have done? The things that I did not do that I should have done? Repent from those things and believe. Have you repented and believed? Then you have entered into the triumph already. For God has imputed to you. Imputed means you have no uh, forgiveness of sins. You have no right to be forgiven your sins. You have no righteousness. But God has imputed to you, given to you by a sort of legal act. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross to pay the penalty of your sins. What have you done to deserve this? Nothing. God has just said, I will accept the sacrifice of my son for your sins if you believe in him. It's imputed to us. More than that, he said, I will impute to you, I will give to you, not through any merit of your own, not through any goodness of your own, the righteousness of Christ I will say, if you repent and believe, not only will I forgive you your sins, I will clothe you with the righteousness of Christ, so that when you stand before me, I see not you, but Christ in you. And I see, therefore, a perfect human being, perfectly and completely in subjection to his Father. A human being, Christ. Fully God, but fully a human being, who righteously lives in a sinful world in accordance with the will of God. And God says, if you repent and believe, I impute this to you. Not that you have earned it. Not that you're working towards it. I will give it to you. I have written a declaration. In Christ, you will appear before me. Have you ever wondered, when you come in prayer before God, have you stopped for a minute and just thought about who he is? If you read in Revelation, or I read in Revelation, it says, in God sitting on his throne, and angels are crying, holy, holy, holy. And elders are falling in their face before him. He is glorious and magnificent beyond understanding. He is holy and pure beyond understanding have you ever wondered have I ever wondered how can I come before him and say father and he'll hear me 
Because when I come before him as Frank, what does he see? He sees a sinner. He sees somebody who has done the things he should not do and has not done the things he should do. He is not holy. He is not pure. How dare he come before me, the holy, pure God, and the consuming fire of God would consume me. But when he looks at me, when I pray to him, when I come before him, what does he see? Thank God he doesn't see me. He sees Christ in me. Because not only has God imputed to us, given to us, he has imparted. Christ himself comes and dwells within us. And this is what God sees when we come before him. How are we acceptable to God, the holy, pure God, a consuming fire? Because he sees Christ in us. He sees a forgiven sinner because Christ's death has delivered us. He sees a righteous human being because he sees Christ in us. I thank God that when I come before God, he doesn't see me because I would be swept away in his holiness. He sees Christ in me. He sees a forgiven sinner. He sees somebody who's been given the righteousness of Christ. And even it's imparted, Christ himself dwells in us by the Holy Spirit of God. And then when we ask for things in the name of Christ, we're asking for the Christ that's in us to be blessed by God. That we might do the will of God as Christ did the will of God and as Christ calls us to do the will of God. This is the triumph. And it's ours in Christ. We have our hope, which is the new body and the new heaven and the earth. But we also have the Holy Spirit, we are told, intercedes for us. Have you ever been in prayer and not known what to pray for? I don't know. I assume you pray here for the, the, the fellowship. What's to happen to the fellowship? And, and maybe you're sitting there saying, well, what, what, I don't know what to pray, Lord. I'm at a loss to know. Yeah, bless us, Lord. Uh, help us, Lord. But what, what, but what, Lord, <laughs> should I be praying for? What should I be asking for? And sometimes you say, I don't know. Your own personal life. What should I pray for? Sometimes we don't know what we should pray for. And this passage here tells us the Holy Spirit of God intercedes for us. This is the triumph. The Holy Spirit of God who knows us intimately because he dwells in us, we who have repented and believed. And the Holy Spirit of God who knows the mind of Christ and is in a place called the mind of Christ and who knows the Father because the Trinity are one intercedes for us do you know what that means God himself intercedes to himself for us when we don't know what to pray for often our prayer should be this Lord tell me what I should pray for <laughs> tell me what the Holy Spirit is praying for and his groanings to you and thank you that he is praying and I know that you will hear them and answer them but let me know what they are that your answer to the Holy Spirit of God's prayer for me, for my family, for my body, if I'm ill, for this fellowship, that I would know it. And Paul says, this is the triumph that we have. The Holy Spirit of God intercedes for us. And we have this hope of the new body in verse 26 and 27, 24 and 25. And also this interceding of the Holy Spirit, verse 26 to 27. What more could we ask for? We have the hope that is to come. We have faith in it. We don't see it. We have faith in it. That's what hope means. This is what Paul says here. That one day, this body, which is wearing away and rusting out and falling to bits, I will be delivered from it into a new body that will never rush nor perish nor get ill nor get sick nor grow old and I will be taken away from this corrupt godless world into a new heaven a new earth where I will dwell with God and with my brothers and sisters in perfect harmony and peace forever and ever 
Wonderful. If it stopped just there, we should still leave this place this morning saying, what a blessed person am I? But it's more than that. He says, and in this life, I will pilot you through the difficult cities of life, this difficult, troubled world. I will guide you like the pilots guided those ships into Plymouth, past the dangerous rocks, past the things that can shipwreck you, past the things that can harm you. I will pilot you to the safety of your final destination. What a blessed people are we. Not only are we heading for perfection, Christ himself dwells in us to guide us to this, through the troubled pathways and difficulties that we face in this life. This is what Paul is saying is why we are triumphant, even although we suffer. Secondly, how do we secure this triumph? Well, the core message of this is in verse 29 to 30 and it says this those God foreknew he predestined and the foreknowledge is not simply that God knew what we would do we're told in Ephesians wonderful uh, revelation in Ephesians chapter 1 that God selected us before the foundation of the world to be in his kingdom he foreknew he knew when we would be born, he knew where we would be born, he knew what sort of upbringing we'd have, he knew what sort of personality we'd have, he knew everything about us from before the foundation of the world, before day one when God says let there be light, before that, before creation, God foreknew us and in his phenology decided to select us, predestined ordained that we should be conformed to the image of his son how we should uh, note that he ordained that we should be conformed to the image of his son he didn't predestine us to free us from our sin to give us the righteousness of Christ so we could live a life pleasing to ourselves he ordained that we should be conformed to the image of his son we should become like his son in his humanity, in his life on this earth. A people who live in a sinful world in obedience to God. We are ordained, foreordained, forenoon, selected for that purpose. If you have truly repented and believed, you have committed yourself to this, that God would conform you to the image of his son and me to the image of his son. Not that he would deliver us from our problems, not that we would be able to have a life free from difficulties and problems, that we would be conformed to the image of his son and thereby made fit to be a member of his kingdom and his eternal kingdom. Goes on. Those he ordained, predestined, he called and he justified. He called. Jesus says in John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. So often I hear Christians sit there and say, I found Jesus. And I thought, no, you didn't. <laughs> I discovered Jesus. And said, no, you didn't. God drew you. God pulled you. It wasn't our decision. Our decision was to hear his call. When we're evangelizing, we're not introducing people to Jesus. We're, not, we're pointing people to Jesus. We're saying, look, Jesus is calling you. If you're here, if you're listening to me, you're listening to the gospel, Jesus is calling you. Not me. Not you deciding that you're looking for Jesus. Jesus is calling you. Have you thought about that? If you and I have repented and believed truly, Jesus called us. He put his hand on our life. And he said, you, Frank, you I have chosen. My goodness, I didn't have to make it difficult for him. I resisted it to the, like, no business. But you see, God had said, a, a, a friend of mine said this to me uh, before I became a Christian. He said this, he said, Frank, he said, God has chosen to bless you, and bless you he will. You can fight and struggle against it all you like. God has decided to bless you. 
And that's what we should be thankful and grateful for. It's not any goodness in me. I didn't find Jesus. He found me. He searched me out. He called me to himself. And that should fill us with gratitude and thanksgiving. And when we were praying for the, the, the lost out there, we'd say, Oh Lord, guide us to those that you are calling. That we may help them to hear your calling. He didn't choose you. Then he justified us. He made us right. And we've talked about that. He glorified. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We are t totally accepted by God. as pure and blameless. We just wait for the new body. Our triumph does not lie in anything in ourselves. If it did, we could not be sure that we triumphed because we are not capable of trying you know, over sin and death. No matter how hard we might try, we cannot pay the penalty for our sin because the penalty for our sin is death. We cannot overcome sin and death. Neither can we negotiate uh, this trials and tribulations of life without the grace of God. If we're delivered safely to our home in the new body, who's taking us there? Oh, it's me, because you see, I, I, I've been very good. I've obeyed God, I've, I've, I've prayed, I've, I've read the Bible, I've come to church, I've preached the gospel. Uh, no! <laughs> What's delivered you is Christ. Not only has he delivered you from sin and death, he's delivered you from the trials and tribulations of this life, he's guided you to your home port, which is the new heaven and the new earth and the new body. Our triumph rests solely and completely in God, in Christ. This is where we can reconcile this issue of we're triumphant yet suffering. Yes, we are triumphant. Finally, what does the triumph mean for us? Paul says that nothing can separate us from our triumph over sin and death that come from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For it's all of the grace of God. What can stop us? What can rob us of our triumph? Nothing. What can rob us of the experience of our triumph is this. We neglect to act upon what the scripture clearly tells us is true. If we have repented and believed, Jesus Christ's death on the cross means that all of our sins are washed clean and that we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and we are completely and absolutely acceptable to God in Christ. Nothing but nothing can take that triumph away from us. But what about the trials and tribulations of life? How did Paul manage to negotiate the trials and tribulations of his life that we looked about? Christ navigated him through it. Christ is trying to navigate us through our trials and our tribulations. The trials and tribulations of us as individuals, as wives, as husbands, as children, as employees, as a fellowship. As a fellowship, Christ is trying to navigate you through these troubled wars. Do you believe that? Do you act accordingly? Do I act accordingly? Jesus has triumphed over sin and death. Jesus is piloting his people towards their ultimate destination. Yes, it can be hard. Yes, it can be difficult. But is it the triumph is assured for Christ has won the victory. Nothing but nothing, Paul says. And he, he drives this home, doesn't he? Let's look at, in, in, in closing, that, that, uh, what he says cannot stop us. Uh, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 35, he says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, 
or swords. No, and all of these things we are more than conquerors. Do we believe that? Do I believe that? We are more than conquerors in Christ. There is no problem, no difficulty, no issue that we face that Christ can't navigate us through. There is no sin that we have committed or will commit that faith in Jesus Christ's death on the cross cannot forgive us from. There is nothing that can prevent Christ's triumph being ours if we have faith, if we believe. I think that struggle that we Christians have is this. We accept that our sins are forgiven. We believe that with all our heart. But then we think our troubles and our difficulties are somehow beyond the control of Christ. We're somehow at the mercy of our circumstances, our, our physical bodies, ailments, our fellowships, uh, struggles and difficulties at any point in time, our relationships with our children, our relationships with our husbands, with our wives, with our community, with our work people. Th these somehow are, uh, th they're not covered by the conquering Christ who triumphed over these things. And Paul's saying here, yes, they are covered. We are more than conquerors. And we need to live accordingly. And we need to have this witness to people. Yes, we face difficulties. Yes, I face difficulties in my life. Yes, I've got health, health problems. Yes, I've got problems in my family. Yes, I've got problems in my uh, work relationships, in my ch relationship with my children. Yes, our fellowship is struggling in sometimes, and, and, and we are in difficulty. The church in Britain is struggling. Yes, we own up to all of these things, but we are more than conquerors in Christ, for he is navigating us through this, and he's leading us to perfection beyond our understanding. And Jesus Christ said this, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I believe this and I live accordingly and I am full of joy even in the midst of troubles and trials because I am in Christ more than a conqueror. Are you and I like this? This is the encouragement that comes from understanding what Paul's writing about here. Do you and I want to be encouraged? Or do we want to just sit back and loll in our difficulties and our problems and say there's nothing that can be done about them? Yes, there is something to be done about them. We need to call out to our pilot and say, navigate me through these, these difficult wars, Lord. But we don't know what to pray for. We take refuge in this. The Holy Spirit of God himself intercedes for us. How can we be defeated? How can we be brought down? If God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer is nothing and nobody, not even the very agents of Satan, not even Satan himself can be against us and triumph if we are in Christ and we live accordingly. This is where we find our joy and our peace. This is where we find our victory. It is already ours. We just need to take it and live by it. God help us that we be such a people. Let us pray and then I'll hand over.